Hi, well, <clears throat> following on from my very brief taster of um, my thesis that I wrote in 1965 on bridge construction, I've had some really positive feedback and one request was to see the whole thesis. Well, that would take days of viewing on YouTube, but what I'm going to do is uh, just expand on the first video and read some extracts uh, almost at random from my thesis on the fascinating topic of bridge building, which includes a few quotes. I mean, it was my thesis at Shoreditch College, a fantastic uh, training I had almost the privilege of doing in London. Uh, the very best teachers across a broad spectrum of crafts, including bookbinding. So as I said in the other video, um, I actually bound my thesis. So what I'm going to do is just read a few extracts and just see how it goes. And suffice to say that bridge construction or structures that carry people and things have influenced to a degree the kind of structures I've explored in my own furniture designs. I think this is quite clear that I don't draw my inspiration from furniture history. I draw my inspiration from other disciplines and of course nature. But at any rate, let's give this a go. I'm going to pick some um, random pages. Well, actually they're not random. I've, I've earmarked a few, sorry, bookmarked a few. And so let's give this a go. Well, in the introduction, I wrote, um, a bridge is a fascinating object, a mere functional structure of a span with an approach and departure, yet a symbol of man's achievement, defiance and conquest. And as Franklin J. Roosevelt once said, there can be little doubt that in many ways the story of bridge building is the story of civilization. <clears throat> now, Britain has a remarkable heritage and still standing today is many a bridge built five centuries or more ago. Uh, we do not possess the great ancient bridges on the continent like the Roman viaduct at Sigoria or the famous Pont de Gard at Nimes, and we have nothing to match the grandeur of the Golden Gate of San Francisco, although the new Fourth Road Bridge is an earnest attempt. Now, of course, that Fourth Road Bridge was built in the 60s uh, because I believe there's a new one planned. The following chapters briefly follow up the story of bridge building in Britain, briefly because the field is so wide that it would take volumes to cover it in any depth as it's an activity which man has participated in as far back as he found the need to travel. Uh, this thesis devotes part of its context to the history and development of the bridge, and then describes the four main types of bridge, uh, followed up by accounts of uh, the building of famous bridges involving the principles of each style. It's hoped that not too many gaps have been left, and those which do exist are not too wide to be bridged by the reader. I start with chapter one, a history of the bridge, and there's a quote here from T.S. Eliot. I do not know much about gods, but I think that the river is a strong brown god, sullen, untamed and intractable, patient to some degree, at first recognised as a frontier, useful, untrustworthy as a conveyor of commerce, then only a problem confronting the builder of bridges. Possibly the Latin word pons uh, for a bridge, uh, deriving from pono, to lay down stones. Uh, as man's intelligence developed, and I see my tutor put a question mark here over the word intelligence. Maybe he feels intelligence is a consistent thing. Uh, the stepping stones were built up into piers, which in turn were made to carry great monoliths. And hence the term clapper bridge has uh, derived or evolved. Uh, examples of which can be seen in parts of Dartmoor. Further south, however, where man had learned to plate and weave, ropes were made to hang between trees on either side of the river, and he was able to cross in a hand-over-hand -hand fashion. From this idea came the suspension of two ropes between which a mat work could be woven to form a gangway, and later came a more complex framework of four ropes 
to accommodate adjacent sides. Thus began the idea of the suspension bridge. Now the fallen tree similarly first comprising uh, a single log then two logs with smaller logs bound crossways and then flattened logs which were covered with mud and stones to form a sort of roadway. Stakes were later driven into the river bed to provide wider spanning of the bridges. Uh, the Greeks were not great bridge builders as they lived in self-contained city-states relying on the sea for transport. Their bridges were mostly stone slab structures sometimes incorporating marble. Oh, incidentally, I made these models um, probably about a metre square um, <laughs> using mud and water and little bits of stone. Possibly the reason why we do not see many examples of Roman bridges in Britain today is because timber was used almost exclusively. But at places like Castle Coombe in Wiltshire uh, and the Roman bridge at Preston stone bridges can still be found. The most important wooden bridges were constructed at London, Newcastle and Rochester uh, being built on stone piers. Oh my goodness I mean this really is detailed of course it's a thesis but I haven't dipped into this for many many years. I mean it's amazing that the type um, which is fading um, is still readable. So I'm just going to pick out at random. Uh, by the 18th century, bridge building became so specialised that the civil engineer now took the place of the architect. At the start of the Industrial Revolution, communications were developed in the form of railways and canals, and hence the need for great rail bridges and canal bridges. Bessemer's method of steel production meant the application of this superior material to bridge construction, and together with the rediscovery of concrete, bridge building took a new course in its history that of unlimited scope in design and to a large extent in size. Indeed, it could be said that a structural revolution had evolved. Uh, centuries ago, a bridge with a 20-foot span was an achievement, but nowadays, and nowadays, I remind you, was written in the 1960s, uh, with constructions like the Golden Gate of San Francisco at 4,200 feet, Man can now think in terms of bridges spanning 10,000 feet. Uh, such is the history of bridges, but mention should be made, if only brief, of their sociological significance, which has contributed quite largely to the heritage of our country. A bridge means human contact, whether it's through friendship, hostility, romance, commerce or tragedy, and history has been made on bridges. A bridge, by virtue of its position, is a natural rendezvous, in America, it is said of Niagara's famous Rainbow Bridge that if one stands on it long enough, one meets everybody in the world. Uh, as far back as 627 AD, a meeting took place between the Chinese Emperor Tai, Sung, tai Chung and the Turkish Genghis Khan. Oh, my pronunciation is terrible. Uh, they met on a bridge. And in 1419, John the Fearless, Duke of Burgundy, was supposed to have met the Dauphin of France on the bridge of Montereau, which resulted in the assassination of the former. Various battles have been fought on bridges, as well as the famous defending of the bridge of Horatius, and even executions have taken place on occasion. On one particular London bridge stood a gallows, and those who passed and told the truth were allowed to continue on, whereas those who lied were hanged. Oh, we should take note of that today. Uh, here's an image of an actual cantilever bridge, uh, stones projecting out from the banks. So, you know, nature, nature is the great creator, the great innovator. Yes, here are some slab bridges. I did all the illustrations. Uh, in fact, this is called a clam bridge. Well, I'm really going to uh, race through this uh, so let's pick out a few more nuggets uh, perhaps the most interesting and architecturally most beautiful type of bridge is the arch and certainly one of the major discoveries in human history although it was not originally applied to the field of bridge building 
Unlike the beam, uh, cantilever and suspension, the true arch is not one of nature's inventions. But even so, the idea must have developed from the corbelled arch, as in the stratified arches of nature, each successive course projecting slightly beyond the one below on either side of an opening until the projections met at the top. The Sumerians developed the idea and were largely responsible for its early form, whilst the Romans were more notorious for having used it, and certainly there is more present-day evidence of the latter. The principle involved is that the weight above the crown of the arch is transferred in perpetuo, down through each wasser, wedge-shaped stone, that is, to the abutments at either side. The Sumerians used mud and sun-baked bricks, whilst the Romans introduced cement, which was naturally more desirable for the true arch. The arch has been used throughout history, uh, only the materials having changed, and present-day construction involves the use of pre-stressed concrete and even aluminium. Unfortunately, Britain does not possess the great Roman bridges like that of the Pons Fabricius at Rome, or the famous Pont du Gard at Nîmes. <clears throat> well, of course, I live in the city of the famous uh, Pulteney Bridge, uh, styled on an Italian bridge, which is uh, an arch bridge. And in fact, uh, for those of you who view my diverse YouTube videos, I've sailed my wooden catamaran under the arches of this bridge a couple of summers ago. All right, the suspension bridge, which I've already described briefly. And at the time of writing my thesis, I had access through a girlfriend at the time, whose father was the chief engineer on the new fourth road bridge and I'm trying to find it now but yeah mentions wire cabling. Wire cabling was introduced somewhere around 1870 and this with the stiffening of decks by the steel truss was a major development in the suspension of the bridge. Now somewhere I'm trying to find out but I actually remember after all these years that in the fourth road bridge uh, over 24,000 miles of pencil diameter steel cord was used. Now that's enough to go around the globe one and a half times. And that was woven through the towers of the bridge. So as I said, I had these wonderful photographs given to me during the building of the fourth road bridge. And this at the time was a major British innovation. The cantilever bridge, now that's fascinating. Well, it's fascinating to me because I use cantilever structures a lot in my furniture designs. And in fact, the old fourth rate road bridge is a cantilever design. And everybody knows that the painting is a continual thing. By the time they finish painting it, it's time to start painting the beginning again. <clears throat> so what did I say about the cantilever bridge? The principle can be compared with that of a bracket on a wall, supported at one end and stretched out over a space. In the cantilever bridge there are two brackets attached to each other and hence depending on one another for support, the weight being transferred down through a pier at the middle. The free ends either meet directly or are linked by independent spans and to counteract the weight of the brackets at the free ends, supports or towers are built to balance the cantilevers. Cantilebron, to think I once studied Latin, <laughs> which means the lip of a rafter. It can also mean a canting or projecting lever. Although the cantilever bridge has an ancient heritage, there's no evidence of its use in Britain much before the introduction of the steel truss, from whence it was developed because of the greater economy of materials and rigidity which the truss offered. And I then say the first major cantilever bridge was built at Queen's Ferry across the Firth of Forth in 1890. And this has been of worldwide interest as it's remained the largest bridge of its kind in the world for 27 years. Again, I wrote that in 1965. I go on to describe truss bridges with different names, Pratt, Warren, Fink, Hogbacked, Modified Warren, Wow.
to think I studied all this. Oh, here's a typical motorway bridge in the 1960s, and a few of them, of course, uh, we can still see. This is the largest, or was the largest, pre-stressed concrete bridge in Europe, Wentwood Bridge, Wentwood Viaduct, near Doncaster. Well, I'm sure that's a piece of history now. Here are some images. <clears throat> As I say, I did all the illustrations. Uh, images of the stages of constructing a cantilever bridge. Old London Bridge. Uh, London Bridge was made for wise men to go over and fools to go under. That's an old proverb. Uh, London Bridge. Well, everybody knows about the London Bridge. A great fire in London in 1136 destroyed the wooden structure and consequently contributions had to be drawn from all over England to cover the cost of repairs. The design included the building of a two-storey chapel to be dedicated to St Thomas of Canterbury and it was here that Peter's body, Peter was the curate of St Mary Cole Church in London. Wow, this is all detailed stuff, so let's kind of skate over it. Uh, this is a drawing I did of a section of the old London Bridge with houses on it. And here's a picture from an old print of the old London Bridge. OK, what else have we got? Oh yes, London Bridge. Look what colourful water that I've drawn. I'm colour blind incidentally, but there's some nice primary colours in there. Well, the Britannia Bridge is a box bridge, I think. And, you know, I haven't found any mention of Brunel, which is strange. I mean, really, this is such a detailed project that I probably need to turn it into an ebook. So please um, have a look at some of my ebooks, which have got turning pages and illustrations. Uh, and I may very well convert my thesis into an ebook and scan all these pages. I don't know how long my thesis is, several thousand words, obviously. Uh, so to wind up, here we are. The Britannia Bridge remained the longest railway bridge in the world for five years until the construction of the Niagara Railway Suspension Bridge by Roebling. Uh, there we are, the Britannia Bridge, box bridge, steel steel box very very strong you know steel girders steel boxes how a lot of um the great um, ocean going ships are built box construction all right let's just pick a little bit out of the conclusion uh we've come a long way from the days of the crude tree trunk and we now possess enough knowledge and experience to theoretically bridge any gap ha uh ha -huh. Certainly enough to prevent such failures of the past. Bridges will grow bigger and better as time goes on and the subject will always be of great interest to both layman and expert. Behind the story of our own bridge building lies that of the whole of humanity and this in itself is never ending. Man will always bridge gaps as long as they exist, even though they may now be getting few and far between. However, we are curious beings, and for as long as we have the capacity, we will always have the inclination for adventure, and bridge building certainly quenches our thirst in this respect. And that's it. That's my thesis on bridge construction, and it's held together quite well physically. It's actually, as I say, bound, hardback bound, so a last quote by Kipling, as for the bridge, so many have died in the building that it cannot fail. So many thanks for uh, watching this and please tune into my channel and subscribe.